In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgression unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his, for, by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Glory be to God on high.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, by your gift alone, your faithful people render true and laudable service. Help us steadfastly to live in this life according to your promises and finally attain your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The first lesson for the 12th Sunday after Trinity is written in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 29. In a very short time, will not Lebanon be turned into a fertile field, and the fertile field seem like a forest? In that day, the deaf will hear the words of the scroll, and out of gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. Once more, the humble will rejoice in the Lord. The needy will rejoice in the Holy One of Israel. The ruthless will vanish. The mockers will disappear, and all who have an eye for evil will be cut down. Those who with a word make a man out to be guilty, who ensnare the defender in court, and with false testimony deprive the innocent of justice. Therefore, this is what the Lord, who redeemed Abraham, says to the house of Jacob. No longer will Jacob be ashamed. No longer will their faces grow pale. When they see among them their children, the work of my hands, they will keep my name holy. They will acknowledge the holiness of the Holy One of Jacob and will stand in awe of the God of Israel. Those who are wayward in spirit will gain understanding. Those who complain will accept instruction. This is the word of the Lord.
The second lesson is written in St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Sing aloud to God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory be to you, O Christ. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. There some people brought to him a man who was deaf and could hardly talk. And they begged him to place his hand on the man. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephetha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened and his tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. But the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you.
Grace and peace to you from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus. The reaction of the crowds to Jesus' healing of the deaf mute was one of astonishment. But that's putting it mildly. The way St. Mark puts it it is with a word that literally means to, to be struck out of one's senses, to have their mind blown, dumbfounded, speechless. But they do speak. They say, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak as if that were the greatest, most amazing, most astonishing thing ever. But it's possible that, that you and I have heard about miracles such as this so many times that we no longer react with astonishment. Perhaps that is because we don't get to see the miracles with our own eyes. We only hear about them with our ears. And so we listen to it, but we sit there or stand there still with our senses about us. So let's listen and look again. And let us learn also to be astonished without measure at what our Jesus has done and at what our Jesus still does today. First, there is the simple fact of what Jesus does. Jesus makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Some of you, I think, know what it is to, to be unable to hear to one degree or another from, from simply being unable to hear conversation in a noisy, crowded room and have to constantly ask people to repeat themselves on what they said all the way to the total silence of deafness. That's frustrating. But I think it might even be more frustrating to be unable to communicate, to, to speak. Think of some of those people you know, maybe perhaps who have had a stroke, and what once came so easily to be able to just say what you mean, the words just don't come anymore. At the same time, being deaf and mute is not life-threatening. There are alternate forms of communication. But it is a variance from the goodness and wholeness of God's good creation. Especially you, the crown of his creation, which at the beginning God looked and said, Behold, it is very good. Indeed, he has done all things well. And yet, after the fall into sin... All is not very good. But then Jesus enters in. He doesn't heal every deaf man any more than he removes from you every evidence of sin and its consequences. But Jesus indeed does enter into our fallen world and he heals this man more than just to show us who he is, more than just to show us that he can I think he does so to teach us something about him. And in our astonishment, that we might love him for it. We're going to talk about some of the attendant ceremony with which Jesus undertakes this in a moment. But, but first we must look at the miracle itself. In the end, Jesus says to this deaf and mute man, he says to him, Ephetha, be opened. And at this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. Again, we I might have heard it so many times that this doesn't astonish us. But did you hear that? Jesus spoke to a deaf man. To his deaf ears that don't work. It's not a matter of the man heard him a little bit 
and gradually his hearing increased. He was encouraged to better his hearing abilities. He didn't hear Jesus and then decide that Jesus was a good guy and that let, and Jesus liked him, or he liked Jesus, and so he let himself be healed. He couldn't hear the words that Jesus spoke. His ears were closed, and Jesus, just by speaking, opened them. This is just as astonishing as, as God in the very beginning speaking into darkness and saying, let there be light. And there was light. We must be and remain, always remain astonished by the effective power of the words of God. And especially from the mouth of Jesus. Because as it turns out, Jesus still speaks to bound up things and loosens them. And he still speaks to closed things and opens them. So, second, we should be astonished by the way that Jesus does this. To be struck out of our senses because it seems, this, this seems to make no sense at all. The crowd came to Jesus begging him just to, to lay his hands on the man. They had probably seen Jesus do that a time or two before and heal someone. But Jesus didn't do that. Instead, he took the man aside, away from the crowd. The crowd didn't even get to watch. First, he puts his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spits and touched the man's tongue. Strange. And kind of messy. And to be honest, I really don't have any idea why Jesus did it. And these things all by themselves didn't heal the man. Jesus' word, his mighty word, did. Yet I suppose it must have had something to do with Jesus' physical presence and Jesus' physical touch on the very place where sin's effects had distorted God's good creation. Though I don't think that explains the spit at all, necessarily. So I don't know why or how, or what these particular acts have to do with Jesus' work. But the reality is that his almighty word did an astonishing thing, and these messy, physical acts, Jesus chose to accompany his word. Does that sound at all familiar to you? It is the word of Jesus, after all. And the word of Jesus alone, which can forgive sins, that restores wholeness to souls who have been crushed, who have been created to be holy, but because of sin are broken, dysfunctional, and cannot do a thing which they were made to do. The word of Jesus, the word of Jesus does it, for it is the word of God. And yet Jesus accompanies his forgiving word with water, splashed upon broken, dying bodies, which is also sometimes messy and unruly. Sometimes the baby screams, fusses, sleeps, even stinks. I don't know why Jesus chose to do it that way. But he said it. His word says it. And it has something to do with, with Jesus' physical presence and his touch, touching us in the place where sin's effects have distorted God's good creation. And so his physical presence, because he is and remains true man, his physical presence is in body and blood, comes to touch your broken body, even coming to touch your tongue. For that too doesn't work as it should. Nor do your ears or your eyes or your mind or your heart. 
but like, like a medicine that enters into, into your body through your mouth. It then touches and affects all of it. It might seem a little bit awkward and weird and intimate for sure to, to be touched on the tongue, to be fed by hand by someone else, even Jesus. In the end, it is his mighty word that makes it what it is and makes it do what it does. I'm astonished, struck out of my senses. My senses cannot even grasp why or how he does it, leaving us, I hope, astonished without measure. But also, and more importantly, leaving us forgiven comforted at peace and whole, including in our body. For God did create ears to hear and mouths to speak. Certainly God gave us ears to hear first and first and foremost to hear him, to hear his word. And God gave us mouths to, to speak of him and his wondrous works, to sing his praise, to tell of his salvation from day to day. Which brings us to the third astonishing thing in this account, which is Jesus' command not to say anything about it. I think for many people, this is the most astonishing thing in this, in this whole account. Why doesn't Jesus want people to talk about it? You you would think that this this would be great for Jesus and for his ministry, for people to tell abroad everything, all the details. What else did he restore this man's speech for if not to speak? Of course, this isn't the only time that Jesus told his disciples not to talk about something that he had done. And some of those other instances give us hints at some of the reasons why Jesus might have done that, perhaps perhaps so that people wouldn't only know him as a miracle worker and that they would come from his, according to his word, or perhaps so that Jesus' popularity and his opposition would come at his own time. But as it turns out, the people don't listen to him and they don't keep quiet and they told people every, anyway, now, some people will listen to, will hear this, and, and they will conclude that perhaps Jesus didn't really mean what he said. As, as if Jesus was using some kind of reverse psychology, and he was telling them not to say that, only to make them want to say it all the more. As if the man who by his word commands light into existence and commands deaf ears to hear, has to resort to mind tricks in order to get people to listen and keep their mouths shut or open. For Jesus can make them listen by himself. And Jesus could just as easily shut their mouths as well as open them. Jesus is not playing games. He did command them, and they disobeyed. The word that is used here is is even stronger than the word spoken to to deaf ears. The word that Jesus there that that is recorded here it means it means to say in no uncertain terms what must one must do. It was an order. With the very same power and authority as with Jesus, with which Jesus spoke to the wind and the waves, to deaf ears, and into the darkness. We should be astonished at Jesus' word and believe it. We have no right to ignore some words of God simply because it doesn't make sense to us. We have no right to say what God has forbidden us to say, even if we think it's the right thing to say and it needs to be said. 
Jesus has not given us ears to hear so that we may ignore any of his words. Jesus has not given us ears to hear so that we may grow complacent with hearing it. For if, if we know that Jesus has arranged to be heard, that his word would be spoken, say, here in church, we are not free to say, I don't need to hear that today. What he says, what he wants, is preached today, nah, not for me. We would be better off deaf than to ignore the words of Jesus. And Jesus has not given us mouths to speak so that we will say whatever we feel or think. There are, in fact, things that Jesus has forbidden us to, to, to say. False testimony, lies, gossip, foolish talk, coarse joking. These are out of place for God's people. Or have we concluded that perhaps Jesus didn't really mean it? Or we just have to say these things because we know better? Or we're convinced that we're helping Jesus out by disregarding his word? There is a great danger in losing astonishment and respect for every word that comes from the mouth of Jesus. There's danger, though, of of ignoring it or treating it with contempt. The danger also reveals, on the other side, the great benefit of hearing and obeying the same word. To be mute and deaf is a frustrating and burdensome affliction. But how much more burdensome than a bound-up tongue is a bound-up, burdened, guilty conscience? Unsure of whether my unclean lips can even, even be forgiven. My dear friends, it is, it is Jesus' word through the ministry of the keys which loosens on earth what Jesus by his death and resurrection has loosened already in heaven. And the worst affliction of all, the worst thing of all, worse than closed ears, ears closed to sound, is a closed grave. A grave that once it closes, once the casket closes, once the vault is sealed, once the dirt is poured up on top, is never dug up and opened again. But Jesus' word says, Ephetha. Jesus' word that can open up broken and closed up ears can also open up your grave and revive your body and open up and restore and heal every ability that was lost and restore everything that God created good. Jesus teaches us to be astonished at his word. And he's opened our ears and unbound our tongues to hear and to speak according to what he has said. Even if our senses don't grasp or understand it. Even if our fallen flesh plugs its ears and wants to control our lips. Even if our conscience wants to bind again what has been loosed even if every grave so far appears permanently sealed. Jesus has done all things well. Jesus has come, touched, spoken. Jesus has died, risen, and ascended. By this same word, Jesus will return and raise and restore you. 
Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join now in confessing the Christian faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this congregation, that our ears would be opened by the Spirit to the gospel of peace and salvation, and that our lips would show forth our thanks and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church throughout the world, and for our synod, especially our district, that God would bless all congregations, pastors, and agencies to serve faithfully and without fear, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all pastors, that God would give them boldness to speak the truth in love and compassion, so that they would not break the bruised reed, but rather lovingly care for all sinners 
in need of God's mercy, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all in authority, by whose service God provides for us the gift of order, including parents and family, our government, our police and firemen, our military and our schools, that God would give them strength and endurance to carry out their duties for the good of those entrusted to their care. Lord, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the sick, the frailing and the dying, that God would restore them to health. We pray also for doctors, nurses, therapists, and all who tend to our brothers and sisters in need, that God would bless them as they put the talents he has given them to good use. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who will partake this day of Christ's most precious body and blood in the sacrament of the altar, that they may discern his body and come to his table in humility and faith to receive the forgiveness of sins and salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who having created all things, took on human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Almighty and most merciful Father, send down upon us the grace of your Holy Spirit, and through your Holy Word be pleased to bless and sanctify these your gifts of bread and wine, that they may be the body and the blood of your most dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, O Lord, according to his institution, we, your servants, celebrate here before your divine majesty with these your holy gifts, the commemoration your Son has willed us to make remembering his blessed passion, mighty resurrection, and glorious ascension. We give you most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits he has secured for us. And we humbly ask you to grant that by his merits and death and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of sins and all other benefits of his passion. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Just a couple of quick reminders. One is uh, today here, right after, or after church at 11 o'clock, there is the second of the summer Bible study series. It's in, at Rockdell Lutheran Church. Uh, if you'd like to, you're welcome to, to come for that. There's a meal after that. So 11 o'clock presentation and, and lunch after. And then two weeks from today, we'll be beginning our fall schedule, including Sunday school and Bible class picking up, which also includes a church picnic after church. To help with planning, if you hope to make it for that. If you could uh, indicate how, about how many hot dogs or burgers that you might eat, uh, just for the sake of knowing how much food to, to bring, you can either do that on the sign-up sheet in the entryway or the one that's in the, the weekly bulletin email. You can click there, either one. 
God be with you.